It's time to say hello again to Maria. So nice to have you back. Oh, hello. We have somebody else here with us in the room. Hello. Yes. Hi. It's well, good to finally be here. Hi, Maciek. Hi, Maria. Hi. Hi, yes, Maciek. Oh, great. First of all, thank you so much. Maria, sometimes people have trouble with my name. It's Yehoshua. And for everybody out there on the internet who doesn't know who I am, it's probably because we haven't met. But um, Maciek, um, I was about to have trouble with your name. And I want to have trouble with some other people's names, too, to thank the wonderful staff that's come together to put together Super Week TV. So here we go. And I apologize if I mess up your name. Boris Delushkovich and Somba Rafa Hushnik and David Andorfer and Andra Shreyak and Roland Bresiak and Lashlo Mona Rak and Enrico Shuru and Bernadette Kirali, who's Betty, and Petra! And the one, the only, the fantastic king of Hungary, still reigning for the 10th year in a row, Mr. Zoltan Banochi. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Magic, thank you so much for, 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 for joining. Um, are you ready for... Uh, how many hours are you doing in a row? 12, 12 or 14? It will be or, like or... three hours. I, I'm i sure that th this will be the most boring hours of every of everyone's life. But, well, oh. bear, bear, bear with me here. Bear with me. Who, and who, who's speaking next? Uh, next we have, you know, someone that my good friend called a Beyonce of web analytics, meaning... Mr. Simo Ahava, but oh. I am I am quite sure that Beyonce had slightly more hair than he he does. So, <laughs> well, we'll ask him to keep the glare down off of the top of his head. So, uh, in any case, um, on behalf of myself and uh, Maria, you should speak on on behalf of yourself. Do you want to like um, thank Machik for taking over for us and thank the crowd? Definitely. And I also want to thank you, Yehosha, for being a great co-host these three hours. And again, thanks for the organizing team. It's been great so far. And now I'm going to go and join it um, live on YouTube. Great. So over to you, Maciek. Oh, yeah, guys. Maciek, you, you're you going to leave now. We have to be about two more minutes, I think. Um, and then we you're going to cut over to, what's that guy's name? Yes, I don't know. I think it was Simo or something. I'm Simo or something. Not sure. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, so so welcome to Regensdorf. Regensdorf is like a suburb of Zurich in Switzerland, so it might not be the most beautiful place around, but but it is a part of Switzerland, which is beautiful by itself. So I think. I think that's like a fair trade in general. And how is it going for you, Simo? Simo, one, two, three. Oh, are you here? Classic. I think we live. Yeah? You know, I've been doing this for years and I still don't know how to unmute a microphone. <laughs> it's doing really well. Thank you very much for having me here, Machik. Yeah. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. You know, I I remember when we when we met in person like two years ago, I think, first time yeah, on people that count in in, in Warsaw. And so it was like hmm. really like meeting your heroes situation. So it's it's really a pleasure to have you around here. Well, the pleasure is all mine, really. It's it's kind of weird, weird, weird setup, but it's so wonderful to you know have this come up again. And um, I just I just miss everyone, you know. It's it's yeah. it's been way too long, and um, this weird year has made all of this just more poignant. How how easy it is to kind of forget how important these events are, not just for the knowledge sharing part but also for the community and the camaraderie as Yoshua always always points out. Exactly. And I think that Zoltan and the team of just Super Week did the glare. a very great job with just organizing all that. So it's super cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
and I can see that you worked on your, on your, on your Beyonce hairstyle. So good job here. Yeah, these are all the latest implants. It's hurt very much to put this on my hair, but oh, come on. I'm back to normal again. My children can look at me with pride instead of scorn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's what our lineup for today? I think that uh, you're starting, right? Then it's my presentation, and then we are moving to, uh, to a sunny Italy, hopefully. So... That looks like quite a cool lineup we've got for the next three hours. And then we will Amazing. handle hand over to Fred, I believe, right? No. That sounds that's really going good. to be nice. Are you are you nervous? Are you tired? Are you excited? No, I am I'm actually super excited, you know. I feel quite a bit of pressure of having my presentation just after you. <laughs> but I I've done my best, so no no regrets here. That's all. That's all I'm trying to do as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. So, how much of a guitar you get to play in these days? Because we see that well, you've you got quite a nice collection there. You, well, th th yeah, those are all ukuleles. Um, you know, maybe ten years ago, I I just. I don't have enough time for six strings anymore. So I, I, I wanted to find an instrument that has only four and it's been it's been much easier. It was that or the bass guitar. So I think ukulele is, is miles cooler than a bass guitar, but um, not. Uh, you, you'd think I have a lot of time on my hands uh, or you think anybody has a lot of time on their hands these days, but quite the opposite. Um, yeah, we have a mm -hmm. three month old little girl in the house and um, we just set up, a, set up a new company and I still got two other companies to run. And then there's the blog and then there's the instructions and then there's the open source coding and the community stuff. So it's it's a wonder I have, um, yeah, it's a wonder there's time for anything these days, but um, luckily it's all a lot of fun, all a lot of fun things. So it's it's a kind of good content to fill your life, life with only good things fortunately i mean obviously there's a there's a crazy pandemic going around so it's not all good things but but we try to see the positive in the negative as well definitely definitely thanks for that i think it's time for your presentation so let's go there
Hey, 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 everyone. Um, again, thank you so much for the warm welcome to Machik and, and Joshua and Maria and Petra and everybody who's who's making this event happen. I'm absolutely honored to be here again um, for my sixth or seventh Super Week. I can't, can't really remember anymore, but um, I want to get right to the to the point without laboring too much on the introductions. I want to talk about server-side tagging, and um, it, which is kind of a pet topic of mine and has been for a while now for a number of reasons. Um, the main one being probably that I, I absolutely think that it's the, it's the coolest new paradigm to emerge in tag management and in, in analytics in general over the last years. And um, in today's presentation, I just want to kind of walk through the the whys and the why nots and the do's and the don'ts of, of server-side tagging. Um, because it's not really, it's it's not a, a migration. It's not a, something that you kind of, everyone should aspire to. It's not something that everyone should do to their GTM right now. It's not something that will make the old way of doing GTM or tag management obsolete. It's a complementary approach that will fit some of you and, and will not be a fit for others. And hopefully with this presentation, you'll have an idea of whether or not it is a fit for you. And um, while I personally think it's something that everybody should take a look at, um, I don't necessarily mean that everybody should right now invest the money to start doing server-side tagging, but more get, get to the root of things. Why is it important to think about server-side in a world where most of the analytics we do, most of the measurement we do, most of the advertising and marketing we do happens in a client-side environment? Um, I, this is the first time in my life that I actually get to pitch something. Um, until now, I've been a I've been a blogger who is just writing stuff with no strings attached, and finally there are strings to attach stuff to. So I just want to quickly pitch that we actually launched our new company yesterday. Um, it's uh, it's called Simmer, the company, and it's our online course platform where our first course is aptly server-side tagging in Google Tag Manager. And so um, the enrollment is open right now and you get a 50 euro discount towards the course purchase if you use the coupon code you can see on the screen right now. So anyway, that was the extent of my pitching. I'm sure it's gonna get worse over the years and, and my presentations will turn to nothing but vendor spiel and I'll try to just get people to buy stuff. But for now, I'll keep it 99% uh, knowledge sharing and 1% and selling stuff. So please forgive me for, for showing that slide. Still trying to stay true to my, my roots. Um, le let's talk about what server-side tagging is actually, actually um, addressing. Um, we have the concept of regular tagging first. So this is what you would do with, with um, your, your Google Tag Manager for the web. You, you have a website which hosts the GTM container and the website needs to send data to endpoints. These endpoints are typically your vendors, your partners in, in advertising, analytics, uh, remarketing, you know, behavioral stuff, uh, screen recording, heat maps, what have you, anything you send data to from the browser. And typically the tag manager and the browser communicates directly with these vendor endpoints using HTTP requests. So requests that float over the, the calm oceans of the internet towards the vendors. And then the vendors, as they receive these requests, they respond back to the browser. And these requests come in the form of um, downloads of libraries such as the Facebook events library or the Google analytics library or the Google ads conversion libraries or they might be these um, pixel pings, for example, the Facebook pixel request or the Google Analytics collect request. These are all just stuff the browser sends to the vendor um, to achieve something. Who knows what? Who knows what Facebook does with the data? But typically it's to kind of, you know, do attribution and analytics, but you know this stuff. So the um, idea is that we have these endpoints. Um, the unfortunate side effect of using third-party endpoints is that your browser quickly becomes a cookie store for these third parties. Um, so Facebook drops cookies with its JavaScript library. Um, Google Analytics drops cookies with its JavaScript library. Google Ads drops cookies. And while cookies are, are you know, a fairly, you know, a fairly 
basic type of technology. They're just information that the site stores for the user. These vendors can utilize those cookies to do things like cross-site tracking and to persist identifiers beyond what, for example, the law or legal privacy frameworks would allow. So cookies have deservedly been um, in the forefront of the privacy discussion for two decade, decades now. Um, and cross-site tracking is something that browsers are actively trying to diminish. Uh, cross-site tracking basically is at the heart of, of um, things like view through attribution, um, display advertising, remarketing. It's the notion of a vendor knowing your behavior and your movement as you move across websites, unrelated websites. So Facebook building your, your profile as you move from eBay to Wikipedia to, um, you know, some, some bookstore named after a large South American rainforest. So uh, cross-site tracking is definitely something that comes as a byproduct of these requests sent to the third parties. Um, and the tracker pings are another way for these third parties to keep tabs on you. So they can kind of just, you know, the, the, the nasty thing about this is the sites are telling willingly sharing this information with the third parties. And even though there's a trust relationship, an expected trust relationship, between um, the site and the vendor, as many researches, uh, as many studies have now shown, it's not just about sending an analytics ping to Google or a page view ping to Google, Facebook, but this data is being misused beyond the original purposes for which it has been um, given rights to be used. Um, these third party requests also in my things like cross site scripting attacks if the endpoint is hijacked and then there are one of the big big problems of, of analytics these days, which is leaking personally identifiable information that could be in the URL or could be in the on the page and then a script scrapes it. Or my own personal favorite, which is sending search terms to Google Analytics and people pouring their life story together with their phone numbers and home addresses into the search field, which happens far too often for it to be coincidence. So those are all the problems of client-side tagging. I didn't talk about the benefits of client-side tagging. Obviously, there are many, um, but this presentation is focusing on those concerns, namely, and, and talking about what server-side tagging can do to address them. So with server-side tagging, you still have a website and you still have those third-party vendors. But instead of the website sending data directly to the vendors, it sends it through this kind of a buffer and this buffer in GTM's case is the server container. It's a, it's a staging area for the data, if you will. And what this also means <clears throat> is that you can use this staging area. You own this staging area. This is your container and you can use it to do things like validation of the hits. So instead of Google Analytics just collecting hits and discarding them if they're not valid, you can use the server container to do kind of preemptive checks. Is the hit valid? If so, send it to GA. If it isn't, make it valid and then send it to GA. You can do things like stream consolidation. So instead of sending essentially the same information to Facebook Analytics and Google Ads, you send just a single event to the server container. You know, a page view happened. And then the server container fans it out to Facebook, Google Analytics, and Google Ads. So you're reducing the network bandwidth from the browser, um, out from the browser, and you're allowing the server container to use its power and scale to multiply the hit to these different vendors. Anonymization is a huge benefit of server containers. Um, we all know about Google Analytics and its anonymized IP feature, uh, which basically erases the last octet of the IP address uh, before Google Analytics writes it to disk, which is a, a, a great precaution to take and everybody should have anonymized IP on by default. And on GA4, it actually is on and it's impossible to turn it off. However, your IP address is still logged in numerous different gateways and DNS machine and, and, and server machines responding in different, different parts of the DNS path. So those IP addresses are still getting logged, even though they aren't necessarily written to Google Analytics data stores. 
um, and this might cause issues down the line. But with a server container, you can make it so that the IP address seen by the vendor is the IP address of the server itself. So every single hit seems to be coming from the server container. And this is obfuscation at scale because now individual IP addresses are no longer forwarded to the vendor in any shape or form. So it's a wonderful way to actually enact anonymization. Consent management similarly doesn't have to be a client side burden anymore. It can get pretty complicated with things like shared consent strings and, and um, consent, consent distribution networks. Um, so one way to do it is to, um, you know, just send those hits to the server container with the consent strings and have the server container decide which of those hits should be passed forward and which should be blocked. And this way you can, again, remove some of that conditional logic from the browser and make it a bit smoother to run the setup. Um, Client-side performance is something that um, moving towards the stream consolidation and loading third-party libraries through the server container rather than directly from the vendors is something that is greatly improved with improves client-side performance. You can add cache headers as you like. You can do local resource caching, storing those third-party libraries in a local cache and then serving them from that instead of always requesting from, from the third-party vendors and so on. And then there's this idea of, of server-side containers being tracking protection protections. So um, many are obviously looking at server-side tagging right now due to things like intelligent tracking prevention from WebKit, making it difficult to persist cookies, not just for advertising and analytics, but for any reason. Um, and similarly, um, um, yeah, so, th so the, the idea of tracking protection protection being here that you're not trying to circumvent tracking protections, but you're trying to mitigate their impacts on your analytics work and on your advertising work. So let's look at um, the reasons for uh, selling your soul to server-side tagging, um, which I've touched on a few of them, but I just want to expand them here. First of all, you have full ownership and control of the data entering the server environment. And this is super important. So the staging area is your own. It's your company's own. By default, server-side tagging in Google Tag Manager uses the Google Cloud Platform. So when, when discussing ownership of data, you have to trust what Google Cloud Platform says about when they say that they commit to your, they have commitments to you about your data. Um, if you don't trust Google's word on, word on this and you have full right not to trust it, the server-side tagging setup is portable. It's running on a, on a Docker container. It's a Node.js server basically. And you can take that Docker container and implement it elsewhere. You can implement it in AWS if you want, Azure. You can even do an on-premise installation if that's the tightness of your tinfoil hat. But um, you, you, you have this capability of, of um, creating whatever type of governance model you need. And the most important fact is that you choose a solution that works with your organization and where you can safely say that you own the server container. Um, the reduced client side bloat is something I'm going to mention a couple of times today. Um, so being able to just get rid of that JavaScript mess that you see any modern site using, um, because you can start replacing those multiple JavaScript loads with, for example, just a single vendor agnostic data stream. There's no reason to load the GTAG library and the Facebook library and the jQuery library and the BAT library and the conversion async library when all of them just want the same bits of information. What happened, where happened, by whom, and so on. And you can build, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be a proliferation of these small, lightweight, vendor agnostic analytic systems, which simply let you send a JSON blob to the server environment. And the server environment takes it and fans it out to the relevant vendors. So it's a, it's a huge, huge possible benefit for uh, client-side perf. Um, content security policies, every site should have one. So content security policies are a way for the site to inform from which um, cross-site origins can the browser download data from. So it basically, it's a list of um, allow listed host names from where the browser can download information from and where the browser can send information to. 
Now, every single domain added to a CSP makes the CSP weaker. So you should always try to keep the CSP as small as possible and not just add stuff there because someone asks you to. By moving to loading your resources from the server side endpoint, you could you can smoothly get rid of these things. You don't need to, you don't need the Google Analytics.com in the content security policy anymore because you're not sending anything to GA and you're not downloading anything from GA. The browser is only communicating with the server-side endpoint. Another cool use case for server-side tagging is the idea that you can process all sorts of secrets um, in the server-side environment. You would never add an API key into a client-side tool like WebGTM because that can be sniffed by anybody and they can take that API key and spam it or misuse it. So you, can, you don't want to expose keys or secrets or any types of credentials um, in client-side JavaScript. But in the server, you can do all this because none of this is visible to the browser. So you can do complicated API calls that require heavy authentication systems in place and you can freely have that authentication run. I mean, knowing that it will cost something in terms of computation, but you don't have to worry about the client seeing this information. So one nice way to utilize this would be to minimize the amount of information sent from the client to the server. For example, for a transaction, only send the transaction ID and then use an API call to pull in the rest of the transaction details in the server um, and then send it to GA. So you can, really you can really streamline those data flows and make sure that nothing um, unnecessary is dispatched from the browser. Um, the power of the HTTP response should not be score, scoffed at. Um, you can do things like proxying those third-party libraries through the server-side endpoint. So instead of loading the analytics.js library from Google, you load it from your server-side endpoint, which lets you set things like cache headers, and it set, lets you um, cache it locally in the server, um, and it lets you keep it in the first-party relationship with the rest of your site. You can also do things like write cookies in those responses, which is fundamental for working with intelligent tracking prevention, for example, which restricts the use of JavaScript cookies, but doesn't restrict the use of server-side uh, cookies set in HTTP responses. So that's uh, in, in my book, that's a lot of really good things. And, and um, if I didn't know myself and I was watching this um, video for the first time or this presentation, I would absolutely jump at server-side tagging right now. But let's discuss the downsides as well, and because there are many. Um, well, a big elephant in the room is the idea that server-side tagging is obviously a path to circumvent content blockers and circumvent ad blockers. Most, or at least many, ad and content blockers still rely on the old uh, heuristic match. So they're looking for specific domain names, specific request types, and blocking those um, if the user has the ad blocker. So obviously, moving away from googleanalytics.com to um, your own domain has the added benefit of if a blocker is blocking googleanalytics.com, they are unlikely to be blocking your own domain. And if they're blocking the collect path specifically, you can rewrite it to be something else. Now, I personally think this is an absolutely horrible reason to use server-side tagging if this is the reason to use it. Um, there is a, a huge amount of, of trust, as we've learned, a huge amount of trust from your site visitors uh, visiting your site that you respect their wishes in, in more ways than one and not just the wishes they explicitly state you in, in things like constant dialogues, but also if they are using an ad blocker they expect or content blocker they expect it to work. And if you're circumventing that by sending the information to your own endpoint um, willingly or un unwillingly, um, you might be you are eroding that kind of trust relationship with your site visitors. There are ways to mitigate this. You can, for example, proactively check if the user would be blocking googleanalytics.com. And if they would be blocking it, you can prevent that hit from being sent to your server. And at the very least, you would need to have a robust cons consent set up here um, so that you have another way for the client to opt out of or opt in to analytics tracking. The other problem with this is that data collection becomes opaque. So, um, and this is, this is again quite unfortunate um, because when 
the browser sends those hits directly to the vendors. Anybody can take a look at those network streams and know exactly what's happening on the site. They can see those requests to GA and to Facebook, and they can make their own, draw their own conclusions on what, what's being sent to those sites and whether or not the site, what's being sent to those vendors, and whether or not the site is respecting things like consent. Well, when you move the, the tracking logic to the server, this transparency disappears immediately. So this means that to, again, this is a question of what you are telling your site visitors and what, what you are portraying your brand as. If you want to be true to your visitors, you will improve the transparency and you will clearly state what those data flows do. You will maybe show, give them a tool or a way to identify what happens in the server. Anything you can do to improve the transparency um, is, is, is worth the effort in my opinion. Currently, there's no built-in content management in server-side tagging, which, which is a bit of a bummer. So any kind of content um, setups you need to do manually with, with, with templates. I'm hoping this will improve. I'm hoping there will be integrations to uh, some of the more popular content management systems or at least dedicated APIs for deciphering some of the more common um, content strings, for example. Cost will be a problem for many. Um, with the recommended setup, it will cost around 110 euros per month. So that's about 125, 130 USD per month. Um, for many, this might be too much. Um, you can scale down if your site isn't too big uh, with a three server setup, which is the one that costs um, around 110 euros a month. You should be easily able to process, um, you know, 150, 200, 300 million requests per month easily. And if you have scale up to six, you can process even more. But if you if you want, you can scale down to two instances maybe and, and drop maybe shave 40 um, euros, 30 euros of the cost with the um, risk that um, you might see spikes in your instance utilization, which can lead to latency as it spins up those new instances, for example. But there are ways to mitigate these costs such as removing logging, which is easily one of the biggest costs in a server-side tagging environment. Also, there's a poor availability of service-to-server -server endpoints. So even though I'm, I'm here telling you to just move all your tracking to the server and, and communicate with the vendors, not all vendors are equipped to handle those requests and they might not have an endpoint to which you can send the information to. But this, I think, is a problem that will correct itself very soon because as server-side tagging becomes more and more popular, um, these vendors will introduce their own endpoints. Facebook already has a convergence API designed for this. Uh, Google Analytics and GA4 have capabilities for accepting server-side hits. Google Ads, I believe, is on the way. Um, and we'll see what happens to those um, um, display advertising, things like double-click um, and... Um, floodlight and so on, because they don't, they don't necessarily have a solution right now for server-side tagging. And then the uh, last benefit or concern, however you want to look at it, is that third-party cookies lose their effectiveness. So any tool that relies on third-party cookies, um, such as DoubleClick, for example, would not have an analogy in server-side tagging, because server-side tagging is running on your domain, and thus it doesn't have the right to access your cookies on doubleclick.net, for example. Um, just as a quick kind of use case for server-side tagging, let's take a look at what actually happens. Um, when you want to add a Facebook pixel to a website without using server-side tagging, so adding the Facebook pixel regularly, uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to add Facebook to your site's content security policy, which invites, <clears throat> excuse me, which invites potential misuse um, in case the Facebook domain becomes compromised, which I guess is pretty rare, but it might introduce um, other issues such as man in the middle attacks if the CSP is done in a irregular way. Um, the site will always have to wait for Facebook CDN to respond. So again, Facebook is maybe not the best example because they have some pretty powerful infrastructure, but other ad vendors might have slow CDNs, which in turn delay things like page load page loading and and other things so this is the kind of the risk of working directly with vendor endpoints your http request will be logged into the vendor server so if you have pii in the url and the refer is not truncated 
or if you don't want your IP address to show up or something else, then you know, tough luck because the HTTP request will be logged into the server logs of the receiving machine. There's very little protection against hijacks. So if somebody does do a man in the middle attack um, and kind of hijacks Facebook CDN or serves um, an almost identical JavaScript from their own, own endpoint, which then proceeds to add key loggers to the site or something, there's very little protection against this. And these are very nefarious types of attacks um, that browsers are just trying to do their best to combat, but they are still very, very popular and very have horrible, horrible effects and horrible impact on, on users. The browser will always have to wait for script execution. So when you're working with third-party JavaScript, you obviously, after downloading, the browser has to run the script. And if the script is using JavaScript from the 90s and doing some slow DOM injections, for example, it can be a long wait. And every millisecond the browser has to wait for some script to execute is a millisecond away from something else that needs to get done because the web browser only runs on a single thread. And thus you always have to hope that there's no performance killing injection happening. And it's literally just a hope. You have no idea of knowing in advance what type of a JavaScript library will be returned by the endpoint and what it will do, what type of updates it has since the last load. And then there's obviously um, identifiers being shared around, distributed around like candy to little kids and cross-site tracking and stuff like that. So these are again, all side effects and byproducts of communicating directly with the vendor. So when moving to a server container, the request is sent to your server side tag management system. So in this case, you don't need to add anything to the CSP because your, um, your site, your, your, your main domain would already be there. At most, you need to just open up communication with the subdomain. Um, but this would have to be done just once rather than um, once per vendor, because now your server-side endpoint will handle all the vendor com communications for you. Um, you don't have to wait for a CDN to respond. You have to wait for the server-side tagging endpoint to respond, which can produce that JavaScript by loading it from the vendor CDN itself. So the tag manager can act as a cache um, between the vendor and the browser. So when the first person downloads the Facebook JavaScript, um, the server-side endpoint needs to request it and load it from Facebook servers. But after that, all the requests to the Facebook JavaScript are loaded from the server-side endpoint itself, um, which allow you to do imaginative things with cache headers and stuff like that. The HTTP request is not logged to Facebook anymore. It's logged into your server-side endpoint. So you are processing that data and it's, it's part of your organization. Those requests are not shared with Facebook at any time. Um, hijacking is still an issue. Like if your server-side endpoint loads the third-party vendor's JavaScript, that could still be hijacked. And this server-side endpoint would just return it back to the browser that, and then it could do whatever it wants to do. However, you can do things like sub-resource integrity checks. You can check whether or not the JavaScript downloaded from the third party is, is solid. Um, you can use Google Cloud Platform's own malware detection systems to identify whether or not the JavaScript is, is, is valid or not. So you have all these tools in place that you can use to validate those script downloads. And by, by caching those valid libraries, you can mitigate surprise attacks because you have the valid resource cached in the, in the server-side endpoint. Um, you don't have to wait for scripts to execute necessarily. You can optimize script execution. You can run everything from a single small JavaScript library. You don't necessarily have to download Facebook's JavaScript at all or Google Analytics JavaScript or GA4 JavaScript. You can, you can build your own little analytics machines that are super lightweight and can just send the information to the server-side endpoint, which then handles the logic of, of creating the request to Facebook. So theoretically, you can build a system where Facebook doesn't know anything what's going on in your site until the server-side endpoint sends the final pixel request to Facebook. You don't have to download any JavaScript for Facebook if you don't want to. You can build everything manually. And there are some templates already in existence that do this without you having to load anything from Facebook servers. 
the performance killing injection is mitigated by, again, not loading those JavaScripts anymore. Just using that simple lightweight um, JavaScript library instead, sending those um, event payloads to the server side endpoint. The other benefit of using a library or, or creating your own little JSON pathway is that you're not restricting use to a website. You can send information from any connected system that can build a JSON string. And the light and the smaller and simpler the analytics module is, the easier this will be. Identifiers and cross-site tracking are things that you can, you can completely decide whether or not to pass to Facebook. You can check the content of the user to see if Facebook should be privy to the Facebook click ID. You can check the content to see if Google Analytics should see the client ID from the cookie or if you should randomize it. And same thing with the IP anonymization feature that I already mentioned earlier. So you have just so many more, more tools for improving user privacy. Now, because I'm not sure if we'll have time for questions, I'm just gonna mitigate this by having this frequently asked questions here and trying to just swing these out of the park because I know that these are on top of many people's minds. First of all, does server-side tagging replace client-side tagging, which is a surprisingly common question. Um, obviously, if you need to collect information from the browser, you need something to run in the browser. You could parse server logs if that's what you want to do, but nothing in server logs will tell you whether if the client scrolled down or if they, if they started watching a third party video, unless you tell that to the server logs using some sort of client side tagging system in place. So no, this doesn't replace client side tagging, but it makes client side tagging more streamlined because you can introduce those simple JavaScript libraries rather than adding huge amounts of bloat to the site instead. Is this server side tracking? No, this is server side tagging. Haven't you been paying attention? So server-side tracking um, means that a server is communicating with a server and there's nothing else happening. So typically it would be something like a, a server-side API pulling in um, um, requests from a point of sale system or, or some other server-side machine. Um, you know, it's, it's something that happens purely in the server. So I would never call the server-side tracking un unless you specifically do something like this. Also, GTM running in the server container currently doesn't have a capability to collect any data. I mean, you, it, you can log the information into stack driver logs and then build a, some sort of analytic system if you like, but this isn't built in. So, so that there's no tracking going on. The data is, the data that you send to the server container is typically proxied forward. You can build a server-side tracking system if you want, but that's not what this product is designed for, which doesn't mean that you can't do it, but it's just not what it's designed for. Is this legal? Well, this depends on if you're doing legal stuff with it. If you're doing illegal stuff with it, it's not legal. <laughs> that's, that is the, um, that's the logic here. Um, if, if you are flaunting GDPR, if you're collecting personal data without consent, if you're collecting financial records without consent, if you're tracking underage children, if you're tracking medical records, that's all illegal stuff and working with server-side tagging doesn't change the dynamic, but it's just a technology stack. You inject your own notions of legality when using it. You can use it for good and use, you can use it for bad, just like any other stack. The, the reason this gets asked a lot is because uh, moving things to the server does have a bit of a cloak and dagger mentality to it. It's an obfuscation by design. So it's easier to think that if somebody is doing server-side tagging, they're doing illegal stuff in the server. But this is, again, part of a trust relationship. You can mitigate this by adding transparency controls, by showing the visitors what you are doing in the server-side environment. At the very least, outlining it in your privacy policy, but maybe even building a tool that shows what happens in the server-side endpoint, allowing the users to review it at any time. Is it future-proofed against ad blockers and tracking protections? And this is a completely impossible question to answer. We've seen now that tracking protections also reach the web server. It's not just about things happening in the client. ITP and Brave are both moving against DNS cloaking methods. So we honestly don't know whether or not this will server-side tagging is a tracking protection protection for long. So my biggest recommendation is to just avoid thinking of it 
first and foremost as a way to circumvent tracking protections. If users should be protected from tracking, they will be protected from tracking, whether or not you buy into the WebKit or the um, or the kind of anti cross site tracking crowd. Um, proliferated tracking is a problem, and server type tagging most likely will not bring you satisfaction in the way that you want if you consider it a, a great tool for circumventing these blockers and tracking protections. How do I migrate a, a tag to server side tagging? Well, you you can you can take some lessons in how to build custom templates, or you can look for the templates in the community gallery as soon as it opens up so up for server containers. Right now, it's still not open. Hopefully, it will be soon. But migration depends very much on the vendor itself. Facebook and Google will both have um, very simplified migration paths, uh, and hopefully, other vendors will follow. Where can I learn more about this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, there are some resources here. So um, there's a, a guide I wrote about server-side tagging. Then there's the official documentation, which is pretty good for server-side tagging. I'm, I'm really happy with the developer documentation. There's an overview video on YouTube, <clears throat> as well as a walkthrough of how to build one of those templates yourself. And then again, I remind you that there's a course on the Simmer platform about this with the coupon code. Um, SPWK21, which gets you 50 euros off the purchase. So <clears throat> I'm running out of time and voice. Um, so I thank you for your patience and your attention. I have no idea if there was one person or, or 5 million people in the, in the YouTube live stream. So I hope that this has been enough information for a while. Oh, there's two of me.
right, great. We are back again after this small technical issue with Zoom. So yes, let me start my short story about CDPs with, with a bit of unpleasant truth. Um, that basically marketing technology, it's a mess. Um, the only kind of advantage here is that ad tech is an even bigger one. So that's, I guess, the consolation that we have. Um, if we look at the marketing technology landscape these, these days, um, these days, it's over 8,000 solutions that are there on the market. And I think that if we add everything that we do around data in general, then it's easily up to 10,000 or so. And of course, in the perfect world, it's all connected. So every tool should ideally talk, talk to each other, et cetera. So I think that you might want to ask in that case, why would anyone need a customer data platform at all if, if all the tools are already connected and we can do everything we want with the data that we have? Um, unfortunately, I think that the tw last tweet by Joshua sums the situation up the best. So his personal goal for last month was to create a big picture digital solution that help leading companies deliver transformational digital brand experiences. Unfortunately, it's not really the case. So we all know that it's everything that all the marketing vendors keep, keep telling us, that that's what we should do, that's what we can do, etc. But it's not really, it's not really so. So before diving into the details and sharing my experience with you, um, I just wanted to ask you a question of what's a customer data platform for you? What does the CDP mean for you? And together with our friends and at astrography.com, uh, they basically do the best astrophotography posters you will find there. We have created a small competition uh, that we, that you can win two 100 euro vouchers to pimp your home office. And if you go to link.diffusedata.com slash superweektv, so it's SPWKTV, you will actually be able to leave your answer there and and hopefully win win the one of the cool posters. So, so I will give you a second to go there. Basically, we will be live for the whole duration of the of the live stream. So for the next twenty hours or so, and you can just go ahead and visit that link and leave your answer there. So. Moving on to the actual topic and to the actual content. Um, if we look at what Gartner provides with their 2020 market guide for customer data platforms, they identify four different clusters that are there on the market and they divide them whether they are managed by the IT teams or by the marketing teams and whether they focus on, on data management or on the execution, so data activation. Um, so up on the top, we can of course see the marketing cloud clusters. So it's like Salesforce marketing cloud or Adobe experience cloud, etc. cetera. And that, that, that these very big vendors for enterprise solutions basically that provide you with everything, if you're willing to pay, to pay for that, essentially. Um, then we have a smart hub cluster, and smart hub clusters are more focused on 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 the marketer side. So what they really do is they combine the data of your customers and, for example, integrate some marketing automation features within them. 
So if we take a look at something like Exponia or Litex or Blue Conic, et cetera, these are the CDPs that would match this cluster. Um, then in the bottom right corner, we have, uh, we have a cluster that basically focuses on marketing data integration. As you can see, it's more defined as something that generate, that's managed by the marketer, but that is used for data management. And in many cases, a server-side tagging could be could be a good definition for for these kind of solutions, but we will move on with the actual explanation in a second. And then on the IT side, you have let's so-called CDP engines, meaning that they are ready-made solutions that you can host on the cloud, like Jahia or something like that and that enable you to kind of build your own CDP, but without using the stuff that is provided by public cloud platforms. But instead of focusing on getting a ready-made solution that you can start integrating with. Um, I think that chart is kind of a cool thing in general, but that's not something that I totally agree with. So looking at my experience, uh, I believe it would kind of make sense to look at those clusters from the different perspective. So from how big an organization is in general, or how big the topic of data activation is in the organization, and how mature is the company in using its own data. So if we take a look at it, we can categorize marketing clouds as something that is, this is basically ready-made for enterprise customers. And that is, uh, that is their, that costs a lot of money and it provides you with everything built in. So you don't really have to, so you don't really have to build anything by yourself. Then we have smart hubs, which is kind of, I think it would be a perfect solution for a small e-commerce or for a small startup that doesn't really have a lot of data by itself, but they they see the way, um, I mean, they see the reason for why they want to collect that and what they want to do with it. So for those kind of customers or for those kind of companies, smart hub could be a cool, a cool, say, CDP type to take a look at. Then for these very advanced data-wise organizations, I think that actually creating your own custom solution kind of makes sense because if the data collection is the part of your core business model, then you might as, want, as, as much want to invest in creating something by yourself. But then in the middle of that, and I think that's where the most of organizations and the most of companies are at, at this stage, is marketing data integration. So looking about at that from the technical perspective, the CDPs that usually focus on marketing data integration are tools to ingest incoming data streams, create user segments out of them, and synchronize both of them with other analytics and, or, and activation channels. So if you see a connection to what Simo has just said in his presentation, that's exactly a part of the solutions that CDPs usually provide these days. Looking at the more kind of technical side, that's what the architecture of your typical CDP kind of look like at, at this point. So basically you have all the different data sources. So whether it's a web or mobile application or whether there's a, 
API connection or a third party tool connection or just server side event or log analysis or pretty much anything. Uh, this can be unified via a common data schema. So basically you can identify that, okay, you, you want all of these events to come with these particular parameters. And then if one event doesn't have this parameter, it can be quarantined, for example. So you don't, so you keep your data quality as high as possible and you don't mess anything up in general. Um, this common data schema and the say application can also be used for consent options. So basically, if you have a proper data schema with, with the consent information added as a part of the of the event, then you can also decide on where they want to send it. So if you want to send it to Facebook, if you want to send it to Google Ads or to Salesforce or to any other tool, that's that's what that kind of allows you to do. And then these incoming events are kind of going into two separate directions at the same time. First of all, let's focus on, on the lower part here of the schema, meaning that that's the event ingestion layer. So basically you can define it, okay, this is the event, that's the event stream that, that we are receiving and what to do next with that. So what you can usually do next with that is event enrichment. So basically many CDPs allow you to um, allow you to create a set of rules that for example will will enable you to uh, to copy the parameter of one value and of the other one and then combine them together into into the separate event parameter or let's say you set an event parameter based on some kind of business logic or in some other cases even to for example write your own js logic which would which would, for example do a lookup in in an external database grab data from there, then attach it to the original event and only then send it to, to your endpoint. So that's so that's basically what, what I mean as event enrichment logic. And afterwards you can just create, you can just define the event-based connector. Usually the CDPs that are there on the market provide you with a list of integrations that you can use out of the box. So if you want to send data to Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics or stuff like that, that's usually covered by, the C by a CDP vendor. But on the other hand, if you want to put the data into your custom data pipeline or your custom data warehouse, or if you want to connect it to Zapier, for example, for some proper marketing automation, or anything like that. Uh, that's um, that's also an option with many of of the cases. So that's definitely something that I guess is kind of in line with the server side tagging in general. But you have to keep in mind that not all of the vendors actually provide a proper API endpoint for that. So. For example, Facebook, even though they, they provide an API to feed the data server side there, um, they still require you to run a client side script in order to in order to grab some extra data and to synchronize cookies or do some other weird advertising technology crap, basically. Uh, so for many cases this actually works and this is a very cool case but you've got to keep in mind that there can, can be some caveats because of the vendor that you might want to use can fully not support the server side event streams for example and then if you see this dotted dotted line um 
in the ideal case, then if you send the data to Google Analytics, you would also be able to receive Google Analytics data into the CDP. Or if you send data to Facebook or to Google Ads, then you, you would also ideally want to integrate like feedback data from Google Ads or Facebook into your CDP or a CRM, for example. But that's also a mixed bag right now. So even though um, you can do that and many CDPs provide you with a way of doing that, there are some constraints on how the tool A or advertising network B or, or I don't know, CRM C is actually set and it's not that obvious in a couple of cases. So these events basically that you send to the CDP are also used to create a user profile. And that's what we are looking at at the upper, at the upper stream here on this on this graph basically every event can be used to enrich a user profile so whenever you get a page view then the user profile can be can count the number of page views that they see user has or if you if you have like an e-commerce purchase then this can go into a customer lifetime value parameter of the user profile and then you usually use these user profiles to to create some kind of audience attribution logic because in many cases as opposed to to the crm that's usually used for one-to-one -one kind of outbound data integration or outbound marketing personalization um, CDPs are used more for inbound cases, so you you very rarely work on one-to-one -one cases, but very often you just define audiences and synchronize these audiences with other vendors. So basically, within this audience attribution logic, it allows you to, for example, set um, set the condition of okay, so get me a segment of all the users that that for example had a customer lifetime value bigger than 1000 USD and then you can grab this audience the list of the users that match this audience and synchronize it with some audience based connectors so you, you can send it for to your email marketing tool for example to to do some work on, on them there or you can also synchronize them with advertising networks, or if you have a DMP in place, that's also something you can you can do. And ideally, once again, this data would circle back into the into the CDP. So, for example, if you synchronize it with your Google Display and Video 360 setup, then you could be looking at I don't know. For example, you would like to exclude the users who clicked who clicked the ad already, or something like that, and and to have it all circle in the harmonious uh, circle of life. But unfortunately, due to API limitations and all the technology limitations that is out there, that's very often not the case. So. That's something that you have to keep in mind if you think about getting a customer data platform. That also brings us to the life hacks. Let's say what I have learned so far with my last four or so years of working with tools like that. And I think that what is very important here so is that your expectations really match your expectations and not, I mean, the reality really matches your expectations and it's not like a weird connection of everything in one place and essentially just a pile of dirty dishes. So what I have learned the hard way now is that when you think about getting a customer data platform or implementing a customer data platform, 
it is very important to start with use cases. So to identify major use cases first and to only then set your requirements around them. I, I know it's usually easy to get overwhelmed by the number of options that are there that provide that CDP vendors will just throw in your face, but it's very important to keep your focus and really make sure that you that you get what you want and not the other way. Uh, second of all, it's important to know that any kind of integration of a tool like a CDP is a team play. So whenever we are talking about implementing a tool that will benefit a lot of different departments in your organization or that will have many stakeholders, please make sure that everyone is on board for that and they are involved in the process, especially for the requirements definition. And basically you will see the best ROI on a CDP implementation only if it's a part of your overall data strategy. Otherwise, if you look small, if you, you know, if you have some discrepancies there, it will just become a mess. Uh, on the other hand, it's also important to verify what vendors say, because even though, even in their best intent, a CDP vendor will, will tell you that they can do everything and that they will support you with everything. They will not never know your business as well as you do. So they take a look at what they offer, take a look at what, what use cases you have and make sure that all the technical puzzles fit together because otherwise you can be quite disappointed with the end to result. And lastly, please start with a minimum viable product. So, you know, when you get a new cool tool like a CDP, it's quite tempting to just jump into that and to re-architect your existing tracking structure across, I don't know, 50 platforms and make everything, you know, the best tracking in the world and the, mo the best analytic solution in the world, etc. But I would say that it's better to play small in that case, to focus really on data activation and on delivering data activation use cases first and do it step by step. So not to don't jump all in from the very beginning, but, but yeah, but start with an MVP and define based on the requirements that you have defined. I think that's very important. Um, as for the potential choices that you might want to make if you think about getting a CDP, then uh, what we have looked at at Job Cloud um, is that uh, Tedium is basically a very cool marketing data integration platform with a digital analytics focus. So if you're used to working with tag managers and with tag manager templates and tag templates and with the general, let's say, approach that is connected to man managing digital analytics sol solutions, then Tedium they takes this approach to the next step into this C CDP realm. But on the other hand, if you're tracking and if your product is really managed by your data analysts and front-end developers, then having a tool like Segment will be their new favorite toy. So I can absolutely... Yeah. Mm. One second, one second. Um, then if you are a mobile first platform, then you might want to go with MParticle, which is a very cool social, which has a very cool social advertising integrations, for example. And I know that we have a great deal of the super weak community around that with, with our rally polls, for example. But then once again, if data collection is a major part of your business strategy, you might as well 
want to look into the into the custom solution based based on either a public cloud or or something else that you built by yourself. Um, so once again, if you want to win a cool poster and share your thoughts, please take a look at link.defusedata.com/superweektv. And that's pretty much it. So, so thank you very much. If you want to stay in touch, just feel free to connect to me on on Twitter or on LinkedIn, or just send me an email at magic at diffusedata.com. Basically, I have skipped this step, but Diffuse Data is my new kind of consultancy focusing on data activation. So if you have anything, just let me know. And I hope that you will enjoy our next conversations with some friends from Italy now. So thanks a lot.
Hi, welcome back. Um, now we have some new guests around. Hi, guys. How Hi. are you? Hi. How are you doing? Fine. Fine. Thanks. Also, I guess that you are in a much better situation now with all the spaghetti and wine. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. spaghetti, spaghetti carbonara. Yeah. The, the, the real carbonara. The real carb one. Italian carbonara. Yeah. Yeah. Nice one. Absolutely. So, so after a full um, job of the day, it was uh, nice to, to have dinner. I, I thought with Matteo, so yeah. let's make some spaghetti. Absolutely. That's that's always the best idea, I think. Just <laughs> having a plate of spaghetti. You cannot yeah. go wrong with that. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And so we will talk about uh, how to prepare spaghetti carbonara in, in the Italian way. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Do you know why, Magic? Uh, why? Like, what's what's the difference? No, 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 no. Like, why we are talking about spaghetti carbonara and not about, uh, I don't know, the, the, the winter, the, the, the weather or, or whatever. Why? Why? Tell me. Matteo, you have to, to tell uh, him uh, the, the, the accident that happened at the, at the last Super Week. Yeah, in the last Super Week, uh, Julien Coquet uh, talks, talked uh, to the, anana, uh, uh, the pineapple, pi pizza. pineapple pizza. Yeah. And so for, for us uh, Italian, <laughs> it's not a, a good thing. So uh, we are decided to, to talk about uh, how to prepare the spaghetti carbonara. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's that's because uh, you know you can talk uh, with Matteo without uh, even even talking about uh, whatever about uh, how was your weekend. He always has to put in some uh, digital analytics topics. <laughs> so the only way was to to put some uh, GA4 spaghetti carbonara in order to 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 talk with Matteo about spaghetti. Yeah. There, there was there was no, no other way, Magic. So. This is what we decided to to do. That's yeah. the, the reason for this yeah. video. Yeah, I can I can totally see that. And I, I guess that the situation with the pineapple pizza is you know yeah. the same the, the, the same like mixing your vodka with something if if you are Polish like me. So <laughs> I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually we were we were a, a little bit um, Worried uh, because of, of Julian, maybe he, he would uh, get angry to, to ask for for the, the pineapple pizza reference. So yeah. we were like, um, "Shall we do it or not?" <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hope no. And so but, we were, um, you know. But at, in the in the end, uh, the we are Italian. The so. Italian cuisine <laughs> for, for duties us, uh, yeah. for us were were more important. So yeah, it's, it's more important than digital analytics for us. So. so. We decide to you've make got pasta, to maybe you know not friends. You've got to have your priorities straight, right? <laughs> yeah. That's make the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I I I totally understand that. And what about the Italian wines? Like, what are you drinking oh. here? No, oh. we are. Um, this is a typical uh, uh, Tuscan Tuscan wine. Tuscan wine, a red uh, wine, and so it's very strong. And uh, with uh, spaghetti is uh, the, the best option. <laughs> but they'll eat the spaghetti or the yeah. they will become uh, cold then. So yeah. they're not so It's good, not a good, good idea. Taste. Yeah, it's not a good idea. <laughs> but mm. Actually, you can't, uh, I mean, um, you can also drink white wine with spaghetti carbonara, but uh, the best thing is uh, if you can uh, uh, drink red wine. Of course, mm -hmm. because sure. there is a, a guanciale. Yes, some. Uh, yeah, guanciale. We will talk about uh, what is the guanciale. <laughs> yeah. In, in the in the in the next video, mm -hmm. because uh, it is an important um, uh, ingredient mm -hmm. for the spaghetti carbonara. It is the most important uh, yeah. ingredient. So, it's a a piece of of pork. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's the, the cheek of the of the pig, basically, yeah. mm -hmm. which uh, is a uh, guancia in Italy stays for cheek. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The so guanciale is uh, the the kind the, of uh, the of bit it. of uh, yeah. yeah the the cheek of the pig, basically. But what did you have for dinner, 
or uh, did you already have dinner or not? I I only I only had a salad today, so I'm super jealous looking at you guys now. <laughs> I hope <laughs> like in really the, in the next super week uh, we we can try to to prepare the the, the yeah. Italia spaghetti carbonara for yeah. for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes. For all, uh... Basically, we will be the, the, the maybe in the, in the um, uh, chef uh, staff, or maybe yeah. in, the, in the waiters and the, and the chef uh, team. And so you, you will see us uh, behind the tables, yeah. serving the, the, the proper spaghetti carbonara to the. <laughs> the That's party. perfect. That's just perfect. And you know, maybe maybe you, you guys can organize some measure camp in in Italy, in Italy again. Yeah. That would be very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With uh, Peter O'Neill, we we talked uh, uh, about uh, measure camp uh, in, in Italy uh, in the la the last uh, in the last super week. But, yeah. Uh, with the COVID uh, situation, you know, only only virtual yeah. uh, events, and so no no food and no, no <laughs> spaghetti yeah. for yeah. for there all. Was no way no way no. to do it unfortunately yeah. as we know but you can course. see but you can taste it so <laughs> <laughs> not the same you know not the same yeah. definitely absolutely <laughs> yeah and i i hope that in the second half of this year or maybe the next year in the worst case it will be all back to the normal right yeah That i think we we everybody hope so so yeah. In the meantime, uh, all we can do is uh, make some good food and uh, yeah. and, and, eat, good wine. And, uh, and have some good wine in the middle. <laughs> Definitely. And, and uh, where are you guys based exactly in in Italy now? Uh, we are in uh, based. You, yeah. you mean based? Yeah. We are close to to, to Venice, mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah. we are in the north uh, north uh, east of Italy. Sure. So, cool. Cool. But, I, I actually was was in this area for the holidays, let's say a year and a half ago, and it was a really beautiful one. Oh, okay. it was a great one. Yeah. I, I saw you uh, uh, a clip of of you skying in the in the Swiss Alps. Is that you? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, this is actually me. I'm I'm trying, you know, to to seat ski a little bit because I'm of yeah. course on the wheelchair. So it's kind yeah, yeah. of different than than the regular skiing, but it's still quite a lot of fun. So so that's what I have just started to do last year. Yeah. And this year I'm already kind of starting to grasp it. And it is a really cool thing. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, have the, the, the opportunity to, to come in Italy, in the um, I always go in the, the, the Dobiaco zone. Uh, it's over Cortina, basically. And uh, there are a lot of facilities also for the the, the seat skiing and uh, and stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah. absolutely beautiful. And then uh, the, the mountains are uh, are beautiful. I'm yeah. lucky enough because my, uh, my parents have a an house over there. It's it is uh, in nice. uh, uh, yeah in uh, Weisberg, which is uh, close to Plan de Corones. Mm -hmm. So the, the the place is beautiful. If you have the the opportunity, it would be nice. Maybe we can meet also. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think, guys, that, that we really, really have to catch up in person as soon as possible. Yes. So. But one condition: that day, if we meet, we don't talk about job. <laughs> yeah. Don't talk about work. Yeah. We can so, talk about pasta, about weather, about whatever you want, about but wine. not digital. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> then it's going to be a real spaghetti carbonara yeah. and not a GA4 spaghetti carbonara. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can count on it. <laughs> Yes. Great, and great. Um, I'm really, I'm really looking forward myself. to it. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm really lo looking forward to ah, that. Okay, okay. You are welcome. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe we can try to to put a ski on uh, the, the feet of Matteo, which will be difficult, I think. But we can try, Matteo. You don't. Yeah. Ski. Okay, guys. So it's time for your video. Oh, so, absolutely. Let's go. Dear friends, go. welcome to yeah. our kitchen. I'm Matteo Zambò and here is my partner Roberto Cuyotto. Hi Matteo. Today we will talk about one of the most important topics in digital analytics. How to prepare spaghetti carbonara the Italian way. 
Spaghetti carbonara is one of the most famous dishes of Italian cuisine, which unfortunately very often is prepared in the wrong way. There is a precise reason for today's spaghetti presentation. As you will remember, at Super Week 2020, there was an unfortunate episode that caused numerous riots in Italy and even forced the French president, Macron, to an official apology to the Italian government, if I remember well, Matteo. Exactly, Roberto. We are talking about the obscene display of pineapple pizza that took place during the presentation of Julien Coquet. Oh, Matteo, the pineapple pizza. What a shame. I mean, in Italy, there are people who have been arrested by the gourmet police for making a pineapple pizza. Julien, I don't know if we can ever forgive you for this, but we can try to make up for it with a great recipe of Italian cuisine, the spaghetti alla carbonara. Oh. Roberto, where does spaghetti carbonara come from? From Rome, of course. Well, actually, the, the Vicolo della Scrofa, which uh, we can translate as uh, South Street uh, in English, uh, is one of the most characteristic and uh, full of uh, symbol streets of Rome. And uh, it seems that the, the first spaghetti alla carbonara uh, were made uh, on a restaurant on that street uh, in 1944. The most reliable story, in fact, tells the encounter between the ingredients available to the American soldiers and the imagination of a Roman cook. The result was the prototype of spaghetti carbonara, eggs, bacon, which later becomes jowl fat, which is guanciale in Italian, and cheese. Gradually, the recipe has evolved to one that we all know today and can be enjoyed in friends' home, in trattorias, and also in started restaurants in Rome, throughout Italy and abroad. In carbonara, the ingredients are fundamental and it is very important to respect them to avoid being arrested by the good man policemen who patrol the Italian's kitchen. In the tale, here is a recipe for four people. Italian spaghetti, 320 grams. Guanciale, 150 grams. Medium eggs yolks, six. Pecorino Romano cheese, 50 grams. And black pepper. I recommend it is absolutely forbidden to putting too much egg in the carbonara. Replace the jowl fat with pork belly or worse with bacon. Furthermore, it is punishable by arrest up to two years by the gourmet police. Adding cream to the carbonara, please, please don't do it. Or improvising a do-it-yourself carbonara, inventing the recipe on the spot. There is some evidence here of the crimes committed by some dissolute do-it-yourself gentlemen. So, Matteo, can you show us uh, how to prepare the, the spaghetti carbonara properly, I mean, the Italian way? Of course, Roberto. To prepare spaghetti carbonara, let's start by putting a saucepan on the stove. The salt must not be too much because the guanciale is already salty. A small handful is enough when the water is boiled. In the meantime, we remove the rind from the guanciale and cut it first into slices and then into strips about one or two centimeters thick. When this is done, brown it for about 15 minutes over medium heat. You don't need to add either butter or oil. The guanciale already contains some fat, which when melting will grease the pan, preventing the meat from sticking to the bottom. Please be careful not to burn the guanciale, otherwise it will be become hard and release a really strong aroma. Once this is done, it's time to dedicate ourselves to spaghetti. Did you buy the spaghetti, Roberto? Of course I did. I bought them online in an e-commerce store and they arrived directly at home. Oh, speaking about the e-commerce. E-commerce Universal Analytics versus GA4. The new tracking of Google Analytics 4 is different than the old Universal Analytics. You probably know that GA4 has a new data model based on events only. What changed with the e-commerce tracking part? Here is a summary scheme. In this table, we have all actions dedicated to e-commerce tracking in Universal Analytics and in GA4. In green we have the actions that has a full correspondence from Universal Analytics to GA4. 
In yellow, there is the checkout action that has a partial correspondence from Universal Analytics to GA4. GA4 actually needs a new specific action for the checkout step. In red, we have the actions that have no correspondence from Universal to GA4. If you use Tag Manager, pay attention to the structure of the object e-commerce that contains the product information. In the old Universal Analytics, the object called product was inside an object model. In GA4, the object is called items and it contains all information in GA4. The product's object is not nested in action object. But there is an exception. In GA4, the only product object that is nested in action object is the purchase action. Well, this exception makes no sense, just like the folks that uh, put cream on the carbonara. Anyway, how can you set the e-commerce tracking with the Google Tag Manager? You can use the guide of Simoava. I love it. It's uh, really detailed and explain the configuration of every single action. I suggest you also to subscribe to Simmo's brand new, the Simma newsletter. If you already have uh, Universal Analytics, you can also use my English guide that you find on Tag Manager Italia website. Okay, back to the important stuff. Now we can throw the spaghetti into the boiling water and cook them for the time indicated on the package. Pay attention because this is very, very important. Every type of pasta in Italy is cooked al dente. Al dente means that we must remove the pasta from the heat when it, when it is still hard. Uh, hard enough to avoid the classic mistake of overcooking it, making it so, so soft, soft. In other words, the pasta must not melt immediately in the mouth, but must be chewed in order to be able to taste it at its best. Meanwhile, pour the egg yolks into a bowl. And of course, add the most of the pecorino cheese required by the recipe. We keep the rest of the pecorino cheese for later, because we need it to garnish the pasta. Now season with uh, black pepper and mix well with a uh, hand whisk. Finally add a tablespoon of cooking water to dilute the mixture and mix again. The cooking water is important because uh, it contains starch that will thicken the mixture. Meanwhile, the guanciale is cooked, and then we turn off the heat and let it rest. Now that the pasta is cooked, we can drain it directly into the pan with the guanciale and saute briefly to flour it. Now, turn off the heat and pour the egg and the pecorino mixture into the pot, away from the stove. This is to avoid the very dangerous omelette effect, where the eggs and pecorino congeal. If necessary, we can make the pasta creamier by adding a little more cooking water to the pasta. In this way, the creaminess is guaranteed. Now the spaghetti are ready. The chef's final touch is the dish. Just a pair of tongs and a ladle. Now we can immediately serve the spaghetti, flouring them with the leftover pecorino and with some black pepper.
the pasta is ready. Finally, the pasta is ready. Thank you all uh, for uh, your attention and uh, see you next year. On the mountain top, of course. In the meantime, enjoy your meal. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. And with all this new knowledge, I think that all of our kitchens will be in a much better shape. So thanks a lot for uh, thanks a lot to you guys in Italy. Thanks, Matteo and uh, Roberto. I think that now no one will ever make a new mistake when when creating when making their own carbonara. So so that's awesome. Next up, we have a presentation by Jose. I think we have actually met the last time during the Super Week. So it's, it's great to have him on board here. And he will speak about actors and actions, getting started with event-driven analytics. So I see that we all kind of see a trend here. And that's probably one of the biggest um, industry trends that we are mo moving on from, from let's say the general definition of web analytics per se into this more event-based and custom-based uh, and more kind of custom and more integrated solutions instead. So, so I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, I unfortunately don't have any beautiful thinking skills like Yehoshua. So I will have to I'll have to just keep speaking now. <laughs> um but yeah guys, I, I think I think we are on a very good streak with with today's Super Week TV. And once again, big thanks to the organization team for for letting us all connect here. It's really awesome we have that option and and yeah and i believe that next year we'll finally be able to all meet together in person instead of having this kind of prosthetics uh prosthesis like like in like in that case um actually this kind of brings me back to the um to the christmas i don't know about the, how did your Christmas went? How did your Christmas go, guys? But actually, for mine, it was just uh, just on the FaceTime call. So, yeah, it's it's very good that, that, that we've got all this technology that we have now, and even though we are isolated and we are kind of bound to the four walls of our apartments, we still are we are still able to connect with who we care about and with who we like to spend time with, like, like today. So I hope that there will be more and more events like that. I know that there is uh, there is online measure cam, or like say measure talks, I guess. If, if you guys are not on the measure Slack, Make sure you join it. It's literally the best everyday source about anything, anything around analytics. And there, there are people who organize these, I think, fortnightly, fortnightly conversations, where we can also meet on Zoom and just talk to each other about things that we work with, but to also just spend the time with the community. And going back to the community, I think that's kind of the best part of working in this industry. I I don't know any other 
that would have a so-called and so integrated the global community where everyone can talk to each other and where you know it just feels like a bunch of friends and colleagues trying to do cool stuff together so that's something that that i think is very cool in in working with digital analytics and for the the past 10 years or so uh, for which i have i have worked with that that was the most important and the coolest part for sure. So, so yeah, I don't know, guys. What what do you think about it? Is it the same for you, or would you rather have any other um, community that's better, like I know dog dog, dog breeders or or uh, fisher <laughs> fishermen or, or I don't know anything else that you've had experience with? Um, yes. As said before, right now we'll be looking into Hussein's presentation about the event-driven analytics. So I think it's a very cool thing and we are ready to go now. So let's go, hopefully very soon and right now. So we're on time, we're ready to rock and roll. We're going to be talking this morning, we're going to start off by thinking about raw hit level data. Okay, so we can talk about pages, we can talk about events, we can talk about transactions, but let's get right down to the absolute nitty gritty. The, the, the dealing with the absolute raw hit level data. What can we do with it? How can we leverage it? How can we, how can we go that much deeper? to make this data richer, to make this data better, to activate that data. Awesome, thank you. You good? Yes, okay. sir. So, excellent, enough padding, enough me. I need to sit down and recover for a little while. <laughs> so, I'm gonna invite you to give a, a warm, very warm, but not too loud, Friday morning welcome to Hussein, who's come from Pakistan. Give him a round of applause. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, very pleased to be opening the last day of Super Week. Uh, and thank you all for sort of staying back for that. Uh, awesome, so I think we've all sort of seen a lot of talk about uh, events in the last four or five days. Uh, you know, if anyone hasn't heard events yet, you know, in the context of Super Week, you know, please talk to me afterwards as well. Uh, but I wanted to kind of step back a bit and talk about, you know, 
the foundational sort of how to sort of think about uh, of events, not how to think of them in the context of App plus Web or you know any other tool that you might be using, but how does this building block you know gets used in everything that we are going to do. Uh, my name is Hussain. I come from Pakistan. Uh, I run a company called Marketletics. Uh, I founded a company called UTMIO, but I'm more proud of the fact that I've been to Super Week three times already. Uh, so I think it's a special event, and you know it's a, always a pleasure to be back. Before we get into this, you know, I need to kind of solve a very serious conundrum. Anyone here think this is a sandwich? <laughs> Any hands? Nope. Okay. All bread. Okay, thank you. And how about either of those? Anyone think both of these are sandwiches? One of them is a sandwich? Okay. None of them are sandwiches. No, oh, it works. Okay. Yeah, both of them are sandwiches? Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, so if you have more kind of queries about this, you know, you can contact Jim Gordon. You know, I spent my last night kind of pondering this question. I couldn't sleep anyway, so I thought, you know, I'll sort of think about all the ways these are or are not sandwiches. Cool, uh, awesome. So we're going to cover a few things. One is sort of my love for events. I've been playing with events for a while. Uh, I think of other things that are not computer-based also as events. Uh, you know, some structure, how, it, how they're organized, some opinions about events, you know, some other ideas that I've had over the years, uh, and, you know, how to sort of collect a rawish version of them, which is, again, you know, sort of something that I've noticed. Uh, so yeah, let's dive, dive into this, right? So one of the things that I think everyone sort of talked about is what's next, right? And with App plus Web coming around, you know, GDP and all of these things, everyone's sort of been thinking about this idea and, you know, putting their spin on it. I come from a very technical background. You know, I've rarely worn the business hat, and I'm not really fond of it. But, you know, I can appreciate that sentiment that, you know, things are changing, and then we have to sort of adapt to it. Uh, I think, like, the events themselves are a very good way to future-proof and be ready for that future, whatever that might be whether it's you know, us losing data you know, or like using it once or you know, doing like thousands of things with the same sort of data set. So my you know, perception is that there's a convergence happening where all types of data sets are coming together and they're becoming one, right? So you have different streams of data, they're all sort of being combined. As a result of those combinations, you get sort of new outputs from the same data set, right? So it's effectively, you know, the combination of these two things is I think very powerful, and us being analysts, you know, have a, I, I hope, like a you know, good role to play, otherwise I'll be looking for a job soon as well. But, you know, that sort of is my hope. Cool, uh, so anyone sort of know what this is? Does this look familiar? Some old school? Yeah, so this is a log data, right? So this is where, you know, a lot of these things started. So you had logs, they still exist, of course. Anyone know what this is? Awesome, yeah, so this is a hit, of course, and you, you'd notice that it has sort of some similar properties to the previous thing that we looked at, right? So it's sending a string of data which has a bunch of information sent being, you know, being sent together, and then, you know, of course, there's a readable output for, for, for people like me, right? And then, you know, if you notice this, you know, this actually has a, all of the things that an event is, right? So it is effectively, a bunch of things that tell you uh, some of the context that you'd need for a particular event. So it has a user identifier, client ID, check, page type, you know, hit type is your page view or event, and then it has a bunch of different properties, right? And those properties are the context that you'd have about an event. So in, in a few ways, you know, what Google did very smartly was that they took what was a log and converted it into something that was readable by a lot of folks, right? And it did so by building a, you know, building a very kind of standardized pipeline on top of that data, where it took those logs, and this is directly from Google's website, and they processed it a bit, you know, applied some configuration, yada, 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 and then you had your reporting, right? So, so effectively, you know, we've been in this world for a while. What, what this enabled was that, you know, we were able to actually get started very, very quickly. We did not have to, you know, parse things out of the log. We could just sort of, you know, log in, but I think the time has come to actually go back to the logs, right? So the idea of the log is 
that you have some information in a very, very you know, standardized structure that could then be manipulated, transformed as you like, like it to be. Right? And then anything on top of that, you can also think of as the fact that it's you know, coming from the log itself. And that has been the case for a very long time. You know, uh, smart people like Simo and you know, Mark Edmondson have done things where they've taken a copy of this hit and sent it directly to BigQuery in the past. You know, you've used Snowplow, which like sort of you know, does something similar on top of this as well. So the idea is you know, it, that data has already existed for a very long time. Cool, so, so these are sort of my assumptions so far. Any kind of you know, major disagreements yet? And I say yet because I'm hoping for some disagreements. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, so we, you know, we were able to kind of benefit from you know, Google's kind of benevolence in kind of opening up a very transformed data set on top of the raw logs. And we've been sort of using it for a very long time. Properties, we've known them as dimensions, have also been around for a while. And you know, we've been using them for a while as well, right? But I think if we go back to an event, which is the you know, raw hit that we have, so to speak, there's a few properties that I think are very common. So these are properties that are always there for all the events, hits that we've collected. Uh, and this is sort of my definition of it, right? So one of the key ideas is that one event represents a very you know, discrete activity a point, in a point in time, right? So it's a snapshot of something that has happened. That snapshot is very useful to you know, just tell us like, you know, how, how were things at, at that particular point in time. Right? So it does not have like, a lot of context about what happened in the past or what would happen in the future, but having that context is useful because you can then you know, join it with other things. Right? So, so I want you to remember this as what, is, what an event is. But of course the event itself is you know, not just the action. Right? So it's not just that observation that you did. It's also the properties. So the properties are the actual context that would make it, you know, make it so that you can actually di dive deeper, segment things, you know, break them apart, and so forth. So an action plus a property is actually a pretty close to what a log would look like, right? But in our context, we're talking about events uh, for users, right? So of course we need someone to actually do those events, right? So we need that data as well. So that then is, oops, sorry. So that then is an actor. Uh, and I don't use users, by use actors, and I will sort of get to that. But the idea of an actor is it's a person that's performing that event. You're not necessarily you know, looking at what they're doing, you're actually observing their output, right? So they're clicking something, you observe that output. You're assuming that you know, they meant to click there or not, but you know, that's your interpretation of that, right? So you have a, an actor on top of that. And you know, this is a very good actor you know, in other parallels. And then we have a few things that I think are about actors, right? So one of the things that I am like very, you know, I'm sort of thinking deeply about these days is the fact that you know, the actor could also be a group of people. So it could represent an organization, it could represent a company, you know, it could represent other things that are, you know, are sort of virtual constructs, right? Beyond just the human part of it, right? And it all, could also represent you know, what we are typically used to, a device which we hope represents one user, but you know, uh, I know how that goes. So that's another idea, right? So you have a few ways you can sort of think of these actors. Uh, how sure you are that that actor is one user or a group of users that you can identify with, I think is something that you know, uh, I, we should sort of spend more time thinking about because it's not really always clear you know, who that is. Cool, right? And then the last thing, of course, you, know, you can't really forget time, right? Because Everything that is happening is happening at a particular point in time. So it is part of that event stream as well. So time, you know, of course, is a very, very, very you know, subjective concept, right? So everyone sort of has their own perception of it. So you know, I come from Pakistan, so my, uh, with my jet lag, I'm waking up at about 7 and waking up a few people up with me as well. And to me, that is morning, but for other people, that might not be. So I think time coming, because of the fact that it comes from different devices, from different places, is one of the things that gets confused most often. So it's something that we have to be like, very conscious about in when we think about it. Cool, so, so this is sort of my view of the world. Life as a series of events, right? So you do something, you then do something else, and then you do something else, mm -hmm. and eventually you get somewhere. Hopefully, you know, this way this would end as well. And uh, this is sort of my kind of series of events that kind of got me here, right? If I think of them as events. 
there could be a lot of detail in, in between them, of course, but you know, this is sort of a summarized version of things that I thought would be useful. So this is my perspective. You know, if I look at it, okay, you know, I got a message from Zolly, and then I sort of decided, and then I did this and that, and eventually, you know, I'm here, right? But of course, if you look at it from Superweek's perspective, you know, it might look something like this. You know, invited speaker, you know, reply, did not reply, you know, came in and joined, right? And you know, this could also, of course, not be you know, one event, right? So one, one of the things that's happening here is that the perception of this data is changing, but there are common things that are being observed by both parties, right? So my arriving at Super Week and speaking at Super Week is being observed. My you know, being invited as a speaker is actually being mirrored to what I'm doing, right? So I'm getting an invitation, the person is inviting me. So both sides have different actors, but like both, people are, like both parties are being impacted at the same time. So I think like one of the ways that we you know think of events in like very much in isolation, but a lot of these things are being mirrored. So there's an impact somewhere else that is downstream, uh, and you know I think we should sort of think about that, right? But typically what we are used to seeing is something like this, right? So I go to the website of the airline, you know I book a flight, and then this is probably what the airline would see, right? They would see me you know booking a flight, kind of going through. Hopefully, if their data is connected, they would sort of see that I completed the flight as well and you know, did not cancel. And that becomes sort of their data set about you know, my experience with them, right? So I think these things are, of course, always thought in isolation. It would be you know, very weird if Emirates knew about like, me sort of speaking right now. And you know, so that would probably be not something that they, they care about. But you know, if you think of events as a stream, you, know, you can sort of see them sort of being colliding and you know, intersecting each other in a bunch of different ways. Cool, so typically you know, these events are mapped to a user journey, right? So you go through these things in the order that, are, that is important to you and then you sort of experience these things. Uh, and that is you know, typically what we look at, right? So as analysts, we spend a lot of time actually looking at a series of things happening together, absence of certain things not happening, and you know, just sort of going through the motions that way. So let's sort of reset you know, what we have in the Google Analytics hit. Right, so I broke this down into event, right? So the event is a page view. Then we have a few properties about that event. So there's like things like content group, dimension four, you know, location and title and so forth, right? And then there's a bunch of other properties that are more machine oriented, and then a bunch of properties which tell you where to send this data, right? So this is all part of like one giant thing, right? And if we reset this again, you know, this is sort of the output that it would look like, right? So you have a bunch of different types of context all sort of bundled in together, and then it's our, our job as analysts to figure out you know, which is important when, right? And typically, as analysts, what we've done in most cases is we've looked at only parts of it, right? So we can't really, we wouldn't really segment by all of these things at the same time, even though they exist, right? So you sort of pick a few of them and then sort of do the analysis. But I think one of the things that Google did very well was that they actually automatically included these things. Well, otherwise, you know, we'd have to sort of think about making these part of our events you know, from the start, right? So I think I'm not sure if all of these things were part of the logs from the start as well, right? So they added something on top of that. I think if we go back from this to events, we should then try to see which of these we, should, we would want to keep. Cool, and then of course there's an actor and there's a timestamp. And this timestamp, you know, if you've had data loss because you forgot to put, you know, publish a tag or something, has been a bane of existence as well, right? So you can't really backfill data in Google Analytics once processed, but you know, it, it's still there, right? Cool, so just a note you know, in sort of the midpoint of the talk, like we as analysts are mostly observing and you know, like looking at the observation of an action. We're not actually doing, like, you know, we're not seeing the action happen itself. So we should be mindful of the reasoning why certain actions happen. So for example, you know, Peter yesterday showed a very interesting thing where there were two sites of sliders. One was meant to be clicked, the other was not. We could only observe one of them because we you know, thought about you know, tracking it, but others we did not, right? So I think this is important to remember that you know, our data set is never really going to be raw or complete. It's always going to have these assumptions that we've made about the data when we started collecting it. Cool. So kind of getting into it, this is my thinking about like what every good event should have. So there's a bunch of things that I think are useful. Uh, one, of course, I think timestamp is critical. You need an actor, you need someone performing that action. That does not really have to be an identifiable user, but you know, it needs to be there, right? 
And then we have some data about like the surroundings, right? So and if an actor is you know, doing something somewhere, you would want to know about what happened around them. Right? And of course, the last but not least, the properties that would make it so that you can enrich the data in the future or join it with other things or you know, segment and break it down further. Right, so I have a few strong opinions about events. You know, you may or may not like them, but uh, one of those things is how to sort of name and organize them. Uh, like, so one of my pet peeves is, you know, when you're, you are thinking in different levels of abstraction, so you need to make sure that you're consistent for all the data that you're collecting. So there's something that I think a lot of folks might have seen with event categories as well. You know, you start stuffing a lot of things in event categories, you know, you're going to have um, a mess pretty soon. It's the same thing with the events, right? So you want them to have a level of detail where it could be easily summarized, but you know, most of the detail actually lives in the properties. Cool, and then of course, things could be even better, right? So you can actually do that by adding like a form ID. So all the other identifiers are things that could change, and they're not really dependent on you know, the, the form itself. So I, I could change the name and it would sort of you know, make two things of the same thing, but with an ID, I could actually make this a lot easier, right? So that is the other idea. Then this is sort of how I approach naming things. In terms of, there's two kind of popular approaches. You can either do the object first and then the action, or the action first and then the object. And typically, you know, that event has already passed, so it's good to know sort of its past tense. Uh, and then, you know, typically it's useful to be consistent as well. So one advantage of having this, uh, you know, order purchase flow journey in the tools that you're looking at is if I look at any drop downs, all of my you know, object related things are going to be you know, together, right? Versus if I had them in the other order, purchase would be somewhere, add to cart would be completely somewhere else. So that's like you know, just an added benefit. Cool. And then of course, please you know, try and document things. I know we are not fans of thing, you know, documentation you know, because it's hard to update. Uh, but you know, we've tried to sort of do that uh, a few times and it, it's been helpful. And actually, this is something that we can automate with the event logs as well. So that's something we will talk about. All right. And then, you know, if you notice app plus web, they do something similar. So can someone notice a pattern in the parameters? Anything that sort of stands out in terms of what the parameters look like? Underscores. Underscores, yep. So consistency. Cool. So one thing that you'd notice is that the parameters are actually, you know, sort of independent. Even though the parameter is being repeated, you're not using a new parameter each time. So instead of saying, you know, add to cart quantity, you're just saying quantity, right? And then that, what that does is that it makes it so that you have fewer things to remember. So you can just look at, you know, product name and just know which event I'm going to segment it by rather than, you know, product name for add to cart versus product name for, you know, purchase. So, so yeah, so I think this is actually a pretty good list as well. So if you want to be consistent, you know, you can actually look at app plus web. There's uh, segment.com that has a very good spec that you can use to kind of build your initial library of events. So that's like, I think that's all sort of fancy and cool, but I think one common question I always get is, you know, why do I need this or want this? Uh, you know, I'm happy in the world that I am, you know. So this is sort of my perception, right? Uh, in most cases, you know, all the tools are, you know, have some dictator-ish tendencies, right? So every tool is, you know, and like some of them are benevolent, so they're hoping that, you know, they're, they're doing this for your benefit, but again, you know, they are making some assumptions, some choices for you, right? So as, as someone, you know, who, who would like more control, I think this is a good way to actually achieve it, right? Uh, tools, of course, have a lot of benefits by, you know, by having like a standardized structure, you can do a lot of things very quickly. But, you know, having that information on the side is then, you know, just useful for other things, you know, when the benevolence ends for some reason. Cool. So I have a very long list of things of reasons why I love events. Uh, I've put a few of them down. If you need to convince anyone, you know, internally, uh, this might be a good list. Cool, uh, so I think primarily, you know, one of the things that I think about is user behavior, you know, is very fleeting, right? So if you don't observe it, there's no way to kind of, you know, recreate it or get it back. So having it like stored somewhere in that structure is going to be really useful, you know, whenever 
whichever version of the future arrives in, you know, in, the, you know, in the future, right? And then the other thing is that because it's the raw data, you can always sort of aggregate up, right? So you can always summarize a count of events, but you can't really go from count to individual things that were in that count. So that I think is also like very powerful because if you have the raw data stored somewhere, you can use it to sort of go up or down levels depending on you know, what sort of analysis you're doing. So it gives you more flexibility that way. Cool, and then of course, so we have a few ways to kind of get raw data, right? Uh, there's platforms, all of them have APIs that you can use. Stitch Data, for example, and Fivetran are like very plug and play. So you basically authorize your thing, you select the table that you want to send, uh, send data to and they'll you know, dump it for you. Uh, of course, that's like, you know, not all assumptions are correct because you then have to validate the data, you know, cross check things and stuff, but it's a good way to kind of get some you know, semblance of raw data. Right, and of course you have cloud functions where you can sort of use the API to do those things directly. And then, you know, for mobile and web, I think there's a few ways to hack around getting raw data. App plus web right now is my favorite because of the fact that, you know, you're using a very standardized structure. Your overhead of actually collecting the data is very minimal because you can send it to app plus web and you can then, you know, extract it from BigQuery. Uh, prior to this, and, you know, I was using something that was built by Mark Edmondson and, uh, CMO. So they built a, a GTM monitor where they were sending data directly into Google Cloud. So I thought that's actually a very good way to send any data into Google Cloud, not just, you know, GTM monitor, right? So that, you know, if, you, if you're interested, that's actually a great way to build your own pipeline very, very quickly, you know, piggybacking on smart people, right? And then we have Snowplow, of course. Uh, I personally feel it's a little bit more overhead, right? You know, unless you have, like, a very clear use case, it's, you know, a little bit of a pain to set up. Uh, like not like plug and play deploy, which I prefer generally, but you know, it's still something that's there. Cool, so some, you know, this is the output that comes from one of these things, right? So it's journey, like an object, which contains a bunch of data. This is all, of course, like test data, you know, so please do call the number, but let me know, you know, who shows up. Uh, and then we have like two different data sets that we're, you know, getting from this, right? So we have one data stream that's coming in from the front end of the website, where we are only interested in the traffic source and where people land. So we are collecting that as one stream of data and then we have another stream which is coming from the order backend which tells us, okay, if the person made the purchase or not. And because this is the US, we are actually using email address to join this data, you know, which probably may not work in Europe. So, so that is the sort of data structure, right? Once you have this data, of course, you can't really directly use it, right? So you actually need to do some activity on top of it, transform it somehow to actually get value. So in a lot of cases, you may say, you know, if I only wanted to look at maybe my traffic conversions by source, how should I sort of do about it, right? I could just use Google Analytics for doing source by conversion. But if I wanted to do, you know, CLV analysis or churn prediction or whatever that is, I would need both of these things in a format where I could remix them. And that, I think, is the benefit. Cool. So, so this is, like, typically like management of this data set. So I'm mostly, you know, for things that are platforms and you're not doing a lot of overhead, but of course you can do it in like billions of different ways, I think at this point, because BI as a function has been doing this for a while, right? Uh, I've been mostly using BigQuery. Snowflake is also very interesting. Uh, on the, you know, transformation and kind of managing data side of things, Airflow I think is a very interesting technology. DBT is fairly new, but I, like, my favorite one right now is DBT plus BigQuery because of the fact that they are, like, completely, you know, in, completely sort of independent from the architecture that I'm working on, right? So you can sort of build anything on top of that very, very easily, right? And then, generally speaking, you get, like, you can build something like this where you have a bunch of different components all organized, and then you can connect them as you need to, to build like a larger structure. So this has a lot of benefits because I can change one node and then have updates sort of, you know, go downstream very easily. And I can also sort of identify problems at any stage of the process. This is how uh, Airflow does it. This, is, this one is from DBT, uh, which, you know, makes it very easy. DBT only does one thing, which is, you know, running your SQLs, but they run it from, you know, Git. So if I make an error, you know, I can always be blamed for it very easily. Uh, so that's like always an advantage, I think, from the client perspective. All right, awesome. So, and then, you know, of course, we end up with something like this, where you have a bunch of columns similar to how you do them in dimensions, you know, ready to use, ready to play with. Cool. One, you know, common thing that we have not discussed yet is 
remembering some of these things, right? So state is very cool. You know, you did something, you had that at one event, and you know, if you did not have a night like Doug's at Super Week, you know, you'd remember it the next day as well. So, so that is, you know, like that is something that you'd want to do, right? So in that case, what you would really want to do is build user properties. So you'd want traits on top of that data that lets you actually remember some of those things that are useful. And one of those things, of course, you know, date of sign up, gender, items bought. What I would not do is build a separate stream for this data. I would just treat this as events as they're coming in. So I would add them to the event where this is available. So if at registration I have sign up available, I would probably send it then and not really afterwards. And then you know, figure out how to extract it you know, at the end you know, in one of those DBT things. That makes it so that your pipeline is very simple and then you have raw data to extract you know, in the future. Cool, so these are some of the common things that people remember and count. And this is some, some of them that we've been using as well. Right, so you have very raw counts, you have sums, averages. A common one is most frequent, so what thing occurs you know, more, more often than others. First value of property, you know, everyone sort of loves first touch attribution, right? So that's one way to do it. Similarly, last touch is latest property value. Uh, but one cool thing about like the latest thing right now is because I have all my stream of events, I could pick latest before what, right? So I could say it latest before sign up or maybe latest before somewhere down the line. And you know, that's like very flexible. And the other thing is I could actually window it by time, right? So I, I could have a 90 day look back window. I could have a one day look back window. So I can filter and get these properties for any you know, timeline that I really want it to be. Cool, so I had a quick question here. What is the most common identifier that we have available in our data sets, you know, in your opinion? So that's the client ID. Yeah, so client ID is definitely one. But if you were to sort of go broadly, you know, beyond sort of analytics, what would be a common identifier that's available everywhere? Name, okay. But is it like sort of common enough? Is it like too common? I think I, I would be fine, you know, Hussain in Europe might, you know, not get like too many hits, but Hussain in Pakistan would be, you know, a difficult thing to identify with. Okay, yeah. So I think like one of the most common ones right now is email, right? So email is something that changes but does not change often enough that it's a major problem. So that's something that you know, gets used very often. And other one, when you have like completely anonymous data, and this is what we used to do you know, for the most part, were dates as well, right? So you have date, and then you have an aggregate of things that happened on that date. So date could be a day, an hour, or it could be something else as well. Cool, and totally. So there's a bunch of other things about like, how to transform these things in terms of you know, some of the calculations that we do. Right, and then we have some common data sets. And use cases. So these are some of the common use cases that we've done so far with this data set, right? And the main one being that, you know, this is how it, you'd sort of organize most of these things. So you'd have like a product feed, you know, that uses a bunch of data sets from different places to do other things. Alert a vendor of stock shortage. I think that's interesting because that's not purely analytics based, but it's like, you know, using the same data to do something entirely different. Cool. So this is my learnings from this data set. You have a few different things that are happening. You know, you're, once you have this event data, you are able to you know, achieve some of these outcomes extremely quickly. And you know, you're able to reuse this. You, know, you have a platform, you could eat the fish, you could have sushi if you wish. So, so there's a bunch of ways to sort of play around with the same data set. Cool, and that of course is sort of my hope in terms of you know, a lot of these things could be enabled by the same data. We are not there yet, we are mostly doing marketing and you know, experience personalization. But I think all of these are somewhat possible given the same types of data set, right? And I think this actually lets us wear a lot of different hats, right? So, you know, I think hat wearing is like a common theme everywhere. So, you know, you can sort of pick your own way of like doing these things and you can sort of be anywhere in the stack. You know, it could be technical modeling things. You could be the one that's like, you know, thinking about the future or talking to executives, you know, whatever sort of floats your boat. Awesome, cool, thank you very much.
again. Um, it is getting quite late in Europe now. It's 10.36 p.m. So we will soon hand over to our friends in the US. Uh, but for the next couple of minutes, you still have to bear with me. Sorry for that. So I think that all of the presentations that we have, that we have seen during the last three hour slot kind of shows how, how our industry is evolving. Um, basically, we know that everything started with Excel and, and some basic web-based tracking or actually even before that log analytics. But now we are moving to into more kind of data engineering destination with all the event streams, with all the, the data science tools. And even though quoting the presentation from the from the last year, we will never be data scientists. It's still quite important to know how the industry evolves and what kind of tools there are there available. So no matter whether it's server-side tagging in GTM, whether it's using some customer data platform or just using your own even data to, to put into your own systems, it's all kind of leading to the, to the same direction. And I think it all quite lined up quite well in general. So that was, that was a, a really nice ride. Um, it was my first time presenting something like that. So I hope um, that you guys keep take it easy on me here. I'm of course no analytics ninja, but I will work on that. I still have, work to do that will practice and and hopefully we'll see each other next year on an actual mountain top in Hungary and and have some good time there. Also not to not to forget the most I think that the most important takeaway from the from the last three hours was how to make a proper spaghetti carbonara. I think it's, it's, it was for sure the most important one. So thanks a lot once again, Matteo and uh, Roberto for introducing us to the, to the actual art of making the real carbonara. And I think that right now, if anyone of the attendants ever try making carbonara with bacon instead of pecorino, I mean, instead of the pork cheek, and with Parmigiano instead of Pecorino cheese, it will, they will have no excuse just to, just that they, they will, that they have failed, basically, they have failed. So yes, I think that looking, looking on the agenda for what we have planned next for the next 18 hours or so, it's, it's looking quite well. Um, from the kitchen perspective, we will see some banana bread baking. So I think it will, it will make it will make quite a good competition to to spaghetti carbonara. We will see Fred Pike who will, who will join us and take over from me in a couple of minutes. Then who else? Then we will have Charles Farina on board. So. Then of course Matt Gershoff, Jim Gordon, Jim Stern, basically everyone, everyone from from the American colleagues that we have. Then again next tomorrow morning you will connect to to Switzerland. Also not exactly to Regendorf or Zurich, but slightly more to the south with Zug. And, and we'll have Christopher Ewald present some, some of his thoughts from, from Zuckland. Then we will have Jent joining us from, from Belgium and the clan joining us from France. And then we'll be back again to Tel Aviv. So I think it will be quite a nice adventure all, all over the world. 
and and yeah, and it should replace at least partially the lack of the troubles that we were that we all had to sustain for the past year or so. Uh, hello, we've got somebody connecting slowly, so I think it will will sure be we will soon be good to go. Um, yes, it's still I'm I'm being told it's still a couple of minutes now. Sorry, but but yeah, but I think I think you know again it's it's quite a great initiative, and just to be able to connect to everyone and to see how everyone is doing is also also a very cool thing. So yeah, guys, I don't know. I know what what do you think? Um, but yeah, but I am I'm really happy to be here in general. So so yeah, I mean I really I really wish I think I sang that well as that good as Yehoshua. Because then I could entertain you this way. I mean, I don't know what am I good at. I could, I could show you my cat or something. But I think he is, he is somewhere else or um, or what? Or yeah. Or next time maybe we'll have some video gaming session or something. If you're up to playing a round of League of Legends or anything like that, then hit me up on gaming sub channel on measure and we will organize something. So if that's something that uh, you're up to, then I always am. So cool, cool. Um, yeah, we've got 10 seconds to connect to Fred. So let's drum rolls now. Five, four, three, two, one, yay. Ladies and gentlemen, for your safety, the use of devices from messaging calls on internet access is prohibited once their craft are closed. Devices with a flight safe mode should have a speech enabled now. They should then be switched off for takeoff along with all on electrical equipment. Thank you. sign is still on, so please remain in your seat with your seat belt fastened until the signs have been switched off. We suggest that whenever seated you keep them fastened. Toilets are located at each end of the cabin and smoking is not permitted at any time. During the flight we go through the cabin by EasyJet Bistro. Our fresh options available today are just filled with either copper meat or grilled cheese. We also have a large range of snacks and drinks. You'll find all the details about our products in the magazine which is located in the seat pocket in front of you. Please now sit back, relax and enjoy the flight and if you can be of any further assistance, please do not hesitate to contact one of us. Thank you. Dames and heren, the seatbelt sign is nog aan. We verzoeken u in uw stoel te blijven en uw riem om te houden totdat het licht gedoofd is. Wij adviseren u de stoelriem om te houden terwijl u zit. Toiletten vindt u aan voor en achter in de cabine. We wijzen u erop dat het roken niet is toegestaan. Tijdens de vlucht komen we bij u langs met onze bistro en team service. Informatie over onze producten vindt u in het tijdschrift in het opbergvakje voor u. Wij wensen u een plezierige vlucht. Als u nog wensen heeft, laat het ons weten. Bis der Kapitän das Anschnallzeichen ausgeschaltet hat. Wir empfehlen Ihnen, während des Flugs angeschnallt zu bleiben. Die Toiletten befinden sich jeweils am Kabinenende. Das Rauchen ist zu keiner Zeit gestattet. Wir werden im Verlauf des Fluges mit dem Bistro und den 
Services durch die Kabine gehen. Nähere Informationen zu all unseren Produkten und Preisen können Sie die Magazin annehmen, das sich in der Sitztasche vor Ihnen befindet. Und nun legen Sie sich zurück, entspannen Sie sich und genießen Sie den Fitness. Wenn wir Ihnen in irgendeiner Weise behilflich sein können, können Sie jederzeit eines unserer Crewmitglieder ansprechen. Thank <laughs> you.
nous avons terminé l'embarquement. Nous allons bientôt partir. Je m'appelle Sylvie et je suis votre directrice de bord à l'histoire du vol de destination de Santiago. Votre équipage est heureux de vous servir en français, en anglais ainsi qu'en espagnol. Veuillez redresser le dossier de votre siège, ranger votre tablette et attacher votre ceinture. Les couloirs et les sorties secours doivent se dégager. Les bagages ainsi que les appareils électroniques portatifs de grand format comme les ordinateurs portatifs doivent être rangés de façon sécuritaire. Les appareils électroniques portatifs devraient être réglés en mode avion. Si votre appareil électronique tombe dans votre siège, ne bougez pas votre siège et n'essayez pas de le récupérer vous-même parce qu'il y a un risque d'incendie. Avertissez immédiatement votre personnel de cabine pour que votre appareil soit récupéré sans danger. Señoras y señores, hemos terminado el embarque, esperaremos en breve. Era nuestra jefa de cabina, Sidney, para la destinación de la de Santiago. Nuestra tripulación se complace en atender las señorías francés y en español. Asegúrese que el respaldo de su asiento y la bandeja esté en posición vertical y que el cinturón de seguridad esté abrochado. Las salidas y los vacíos deben estar despejados. Y el equipaje, incluyendo los dispositivos electrónicos más grandes como los computadoras portátiles, deben estar bien guardadas. Los dispositivos electrónicos portátiles deben configurarse en modo avión. Si su dispositivo electrónico se cae dentro del asiento, no mueve el asiento ni trate de confirmar usted mismo. Informe inmediato a un miembro de la tripulación para garantizar que el dispositivo se recupere con seguridad. Gentlemen, for your safety, the use of devices for messaging calls on internet access is prohibited once aircraft doors are closed. Devices with a sign safe function have this speech enabled now. This should then be switched off for takeoff along with all other electrical equipment. Thank you. Gentlemen, the seatbelt sign is still on, so please remain in your seat with your seatbelt fastened until the signs have been switched off. We suggest that whenever seated, you keep them fastened. Toilets are located at each end of the cabin, and smoking is not permitted at any time. During the flight, we go through the cabin for EasyJet Bistro. Our fresh options available today are sandwiches filled with either copper meat or clear cheese. We also have a large range of snacks and drinks. You will find all the details about our products in the magazine which is located in the seat pocket in front of you. Please now sit back, relax and enjoy the flight and if you can be of any further assistance, please do not hesitate to contact one of us. Thank you. Dames and here, the seatbelt sign is nog aan. We verzoeken u in uw stoel te blijven en uw riem om te houden totdat het licht gedoofd is. Wij adviseren u de stoel riem om te houden terwijl u zit. Toiletten vindt u aan voor en achter in de cabine. We wijzen nu erop dat de roken niet is toegestaan. Tijdens de vlucht komen we bij u langs met onze bistro en boutique service. Informatie over onze producten vindt u in het tijdschrift in het opbergvakje voor u. Wij wensen u een plezierige vlucht. Als u nog wensen heeft, laat het ons weten. Bis der Kapitän das Anschnallzeichen ausgeschaltet hat. Wir empfehlen Ihnen, während des Flugs angeschnallt zu bleiben. Die Toiletten befinden sich jeweils am Kabinenende. Das Rauchen ist zu keiner Zeit gestattet. Wir werden im Verlauf des Fluges mit den Bistro und den Services durch die Kabine gehen. Mehrere Informationen zu all unseren Produkten und Preisen können Sie die Magazin annehmen, das sich in der Sitztasche vor
week, super week. Welcome to Milwaukee. I said a super week, super week. Welcome to Milwaukee. Well, my name is Fred Pike, and I'm going to do some talking. 